This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live with two very handsome young men who, um, <laughs> who join us together for Energy in America from Washington. Uh, and they, uh, they are at the, the level of, um, of um, uh, attire that we like to see. <laughs> and that's Lou Pugliarisi at, at the left and Jeff Kissel at the right. And they've come, they've come from a party, so they're in the right mood for a discussion of the natural <laughs> gas boom uh, in America. That's great. Welcome to the show, Lou and Jeff. It's so nice to see you guys. It's good to be here. Great to see you, Jay. And, and we've come from opposite parties, of course. One of us is a Republican, the other a Democrat. And actually, the very nice woman sitting next to Jeff tonight is a UH graduate. I just want to point that out. So um, you know, what party did you come from, and what has it got to do with natural gas? So uh, tomorrow, and you can put the slide up if you like, uh, we are holding a workshop on the kind of the future of the natural gas production platform, which has a lot of interesting opportunities, but also a lot of interesting challenges. And tomorrow we're going to explore those opportunities and challenges. And uh, Jeff, uh, one of our trustees at the Energy Policy Research Foundation, kindly hosted a dinner this evening for many of the participants at a local restaurant right on the Potomac River called Pio La Mare. Uh -huh. You know, it, it was a pleasure It was a pleasure <laughs> to do that and reconnect with so many people who have had a connection to Hawaii, Jay. And I, I want to make a comment to kind of set the tone for what we're going to discuss tomorrow and how it might affect the Hawaiian Islands. The Hawaiian Islands, of course, are surrounded by an ocean of salt water. But what's happening now driven largely by investment from japan and other asian countries is hawaii is being surrounded by an ocean of natural gas mm. and unfortunately it, it has decided with current policy not to take advantage of that to diversify its energy its energy base but there are literally hundreds of billions of dollars being invested around the pacific rim to distribute to transport and to use this incredibly important natural resource in the world today. Just to, uh, to get definition straight on, is, is natural gas, and for the purposes of this discussion, the same thing as LNG? Is LNG the same thing as natural gas? Yes. Uh, LNG is when you take natural gas and cool it so, so much that it turns into a liquid. And when you do that, it, it becomes compressed, and you can put it in a tanker and move it around the world to literally hundreds of locations that are now capable of warming that gas up called regas and use it in local city distribution systems or power plants. And it's significantly so, cheaper, significantly cheaper than other uh, similar forms of uh, fossil fuel, no? So it's probably not cheaper than coal. But if you have a lot of air pollution and particulates, like in China and Beijing or Mumbai and India or parts of Thailand and Bangladesh, it's very attractive and cost effective. Mm. And it's also effective from a carbon footprint standpoint and as, a, as both a transportation fuel and a power generating fuel. It's not perfect. Nothing is. Yeah, I'm living proof of that, Jay. <laughs> but but the fact but the the, the the fact the fact is that if you look at the carbon footprint, well to wheel of natural gas versus petroleum, certainly you're way ahead with, with natural gas. Even if you look at the cost of building and maintaining some of the renewables, you have a lower carbon footprint with natural gas, especially because we can sequester a lot of CO two in some of the formations we use to extract natural gas. So we have an enormous amount of natural gas in this country, in this continent, right? And we, and we have the yeah. great prospect of selling it in other continents, right? Yes, actually, it's a great point. And if you, I don't know if you have the first slide up yet. If you look at the first slide, it shows what the issues we're going to talk about at the workshop tomorrow. Yeah, let's see that again. We and, had it up. Let's uh, put it up again, and you can go through those. Okay, let's put it up for a second. So, if you think about it, our real problem is, is we have too much gas. And we have too much gas 
because um, one, we uh, we don't have a home for all of this gas. We've got to find demand centers, and two, uh, we if we can't find a place for this gas in some parts of the United States, particularly Texas, this gas will back up. And because it's associated with the production of oil, we might have to curtail our oil production. So what, uh, several of the themes in tomorrow's workshop will be how much gas do we have? What do we do about the so-called associated gas? How do we get this gas to market? And finally, how do we deal with trade disputes, which might make our gas a little expensive? It sounds, uh, from this discussion and from other discussions we've had in the past, that um, the United States is on the brink of a huge economic um, activity here. And uh, this, this is a big deal uh, to develop our resources in natural gas. Am I right? It's four-pronged. It's investment and return on capital. It's American jobs. It's transportation and renewing the U.S. transportation infrastructure pipeline is a huge part of the U.S. transportation infrastructure. And finally, it is, in fact, an enabler of more renewable technology. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good now point you... because you do, need, you do need the gas to deal with the intermittency of a lot of renewables, particularly solar and wind. One footnote point, and this goes to a conversation I had with Lou a couple of weeks ago, and that is um, if there's a tariff on steel uh, from, say, China, uh, that affects our ability to build long pipelines, no? How, how, what kind of effect does the tariff have on our prospects in building out infrastructure uh, for natural gas? So I would say two points there. One is we don't really know how much... Of a t we do have tariffs on steel and aluminum, but the Trump administration has exempted a lot of countries from that tariff. It's slowly merging, slowly moving to a tariff only on China. The Japanese are in intensive discussions now. Mm -hmm. But it's not good. It's not a good outcome. And but one of the things I want to do, if you go to the next slide, Jay, you can see what's happened to gas production in the U.S. Okay, let's go to the next slide, and that would be, it's called total dry gas production year-to-year -year growth. Right. And you can see it's quite remarkable. And much of it is in the unconventional area, what we call shale gas, or unconventional. Okay, what is that telling now, us? What is that telling us, though? That's telling us that in the absence of the shale gas revolution, we would be in a really poor position. But because of our ability to drill and produce oil from source rock, from the basic mother of all oil and gas, we are now the world's largest natural gas producer in the, in the world. Yeah. Not only that, Jay, you know, people of Hawaii are benefiting from this uh, in, in areas that they don't really know about. The fact that the gas comes up with oil is keeping oil prices at a moderate level. You recall during the, the worst of the oil price spike, we were paying 800 to to $1,000 in fuel charges to get a plane from Japan to Honolulu. Those charges have essentially gone away. And so those people, more people can come to Hawaii, more people can spend their dollars in Hawaii or yen or yuan, and more people can effectively help the Hawaiian economy. The, the, the Hawaiian economy, if I could get on my political uh, bandwagon for a moment, owes it to those visitors to make their visiting experience as cost-effective as possible. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that by driving up the price of energy. Yeah. Uh, I, sh I should mention, we're not going to take a break, but I do want to mention uh, that Lou Pugliarisi is the president and CEO of, CEO of EPRINC, and... Uh, uh, Jeff Kissel is uh, associated with eBrink, uh, uh, and uh, he is the former CEO of Hawaii Gas right here in Hawaii. That's why he can speak about Hawaii in, in such terms. So, uh, Actually, Jeff Kissel is our most valuable trustee. <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> On the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
By the way, I, I should ask, when, when this show is over, and it will be in a few minutes, are you guys going to go back to the party? I plan to go back because they didn't seem to be ready to stop. <laughs> I think Jeff is pretty tired. <laughs> so uh, tell us more about, uh, you know, this discussion. Did you organize the discussion? Is this an EPRINC uh, conference? What, what, how did yeah, this get organized? The workshop tomorrow, and actually, why don't you go to the next slide? I think it shows total dry gas production year-to-year -year growth uh, with associated production. It says, uh, thing I just, is this the right one, new infrastructure required? Okay, we can go to that one. One of the interesting issues is uh, if we are going to become a major player in the world natural gas market, we don't only have to build the facilities close to the ports to liquefy the gas. We're going to have to move the gas from where it's produced to the ports where, that, where it can be liquefied and sent abroad. And the big problem we have in the U.S. is we don't have a very effective system for permitting, building, and financing out the infrastructure. We have a lot of a lot of conflict on this issue because many stakeholders believe that it's a mistake to rely upon fossil fuels. That much like the Hawaiian government, they think we should go 100% renewable. Mm, that's the target. Yeah. So. Um, you know what? When you have this conference, when you raise these points and, and show these uh, these demographics and data, um, what what is the point you want people to take home from this conference? Uh, I mean, the, the, tonight's uh, dinner and I guess tomorrow's workshop. Uh, how do you, how do you want to uh, you know affect their thinking? I think that you know for for us, we want people, we want policymakers who will be in the room to make decisions based on the reality of what's happening on the ground, not on unrealistic aspirational views of the world. And I think our view is not to tell policymakers what to do, but to let them understand what the, you know, what the conditions are on the ground so that at least they're making these decisions on the reality of what's happening and not what a lot of people tell them they wish were happening. And to translate that into what's going on in Hawaii, you have to look at the goals. If the goal is renewable energy, the price is grid instability. The price is high cost and a sacrifice of social services and other, other things that we want in society. So the Energy Policy Research Foundation is, is in no way advocating one over another they're advocating a realistic valuation of the alternatives. Well, in an optimal way, how, how do you see this unfolding? I mean, uh, I, I suppose this is going to be in, discussed in some detail at the conference. Now, how, how do you, ideally, how do you see this, this, this initiative, this new um, opportunity to, to develop unfolding? So I think there, in the U.S., there are a lot of problems at the ground level. So tomorrow we're going to have the president of the international, I mean, of the Interstate Natural Gas Association. We're going to have somebody from the Interior Department. We're going to have folks extremely knowledgeable about all the problems having to do with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, how you get projects approved, how you engage with local communities and stakeholders. So there's no magic bullet for this. It's a lot of hard work at the ground level and engagement. They sort of try to hope that an intelligent conversation will give us a more rational answer. Would you say the development of natural gas is inevitable? And, and from your point of view, Jeff, uh, would you say that Hawaii has to follow this because uh, it's, a, it's going to be a big picture in the energy landscape in, in the country and likely the world? Well, Hawaii has a choice of following it or continuing on the path of using, as, as I've said to you in past programs, continuing to use fuel oil. Fuel oil is going to become more and more expensive because the demand for the low sulfur fuel oil that Hawaii uses today is, is growing. Hawaii cannot, and it's demonstrated that now time and time again. 
Hawaii cannot convert overnight to renewables. It needs a path to renewables. And so uh, natural gas is one good path to renewables. It, to me, based on the economics, is a much more cost-effective path than fuel oil. And those are the two main choices, unless you decide you want to use coal again. <laughs> Thank and you I for might, that. <laughs> and I might add that you know, Jeff is on to a very interesting point here, because in 2020, all the fuel oil used by the marine you know, the tankers, the cargo tankers, uh, will be moving to a lower sulfur standard. And this means, at least for the interim, we think fuel oil prices are likely to go up considerably. Let me ask one last so question. Go, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. You've got the worst of the situations facing Hawaii. It's a Hobson's choice. You've got a rising price for fuel oil and you have, you're being drained of the capital it takes to convert the infrastructure to utilize a lower cost fuel. So, so you, you've got the worst of both worlds facing you. I just want to ask uh, you know, one other question, and that is uh, um, what, what role in, in the discussion and in the implementation of the ideas that come out at, at uh, this, uh, uh, this workshop tomorrow, uh, does the government play? What do you need, what do we need from the federal government in order to properly, um, you know, develop this, this resource? So we need uh, policies which are robust under uncertainty, that are, are flexible enough to allow for market forces to emerge and to address a wide range of outcomes for which we cannot predict. And we don't need a government policy in which they have a locked-in vision of the future, which might be correct, but is often not correct. Yeah. Well, great to talk to you guys. I'm sorry we don't have more time. I hope we can do this again. I really like the two of you together, especially in that beautiful yeah, room. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're going to make us buy new ties next time. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I'll be sending you a note about what kind of design <laughs> for the ties. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Lou, you have to go back to the party now, and Jeff, you have to get rest because tomorrow's a big day. <laughs> and I, I wish you well on your conference, and I hope we can get together again in two weeks hence uh, to talk about how it well, went, look, among other things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Aloha, Jeff. Thank Aloha. you, Lou. Thank you, Jeff Kissel. Aloha. Make